Good morning, good afternoon to everybody in the US and in Europe, respectively. Thank you for joining us today for this virtual event that uh, DataArt has organized in collaboration with our colleagues at AWS. Today, we're gonna give you an overview of an integrated suite of capabilities and technologies for data analytics provided uh, by AWS. We have a lot of ground to cover, and because we only have a, a one short hour to do it today, by necessity, the uh, content is gonna remain relatively high level, but we fully intend to continue the series of events. And in fact, uh, please be on the lookout for a poll towards the end of the session today, where we will ask you to identify a particular areas of focus that are of interest to you and your organization so that we can um, target uh, the content for our futures, of our future sessions uh, to your interests. We have three speakers with us today. Um, Jamie Hart. Jamie Hart leads the global business development team for data analytics solutions for insurance at AWS. And I think we're lucky to have Jamie speak to us today, particularly because insurance as a sector is going through a rapid and profound transformation precisely in the area of data analytics. So any success stories or examples of uh, use cases that are taking place in that sector, I think, uh, have particular relevance. Data Art is represented by Alexi Utkin. Alexi is a principal solution consultant and the leader of uh, data, arts, data and analytics practice based in London. And Oleg Komisarov, who is a principal consultant and a solution architect based here in New York. Uh, a quick point of process, you should see a Q&A button towards the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, at any time during the session today, please take advantage of this functionality and type in your question. We will try to reserve some Q&A time towards the end of the webinar, but even if we run out of time and we don't get to your particular question, uh, we will make sure that the speakers answer them later and we'll distribute questions and answers together with the link to a re the recording of the session once that becomes available. So please be on the lookout for that email in a couple of days. Um, before we begin, let's bring up poll number one today. Uh, we would be really curious to understand what your organizations are working on with respect to data analytics capabilities. So what are your current initiatives? What are you planning for the near future? Please take a look at the options on your screen and select all that apply to you. I think you might need to scroll a little bit. Um, so make sure you see all of the options on your screen. Let's give ourselves uh, 30 seconds or so to make sure the answers come in. All right, uh, can we please bring up the results? Uh-huh, thank you. Thank you for that. Very interesting to see uh, clearly a lot going on in your organization as well. We hope that today's overview will be uh, of some value to you. And uh, again, we're very happy as we're working with our customers to, to also uh, chat with you about the initiatives that you're working on and uh, in our future events to focus on the particular areas that you find most interesting. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Jamie. Without any further ado, Jamie, very good to see you and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Peter, um, and, and welcome all. Uh, as I share my screen here, I want to uh, very quickly talk about the innovation um, that's going on across industries. Um, certainly digital innovation started back in the late 90s, early 2000s with the startup craze. Um, the advent of new digital technologies allowed many industries to really kind of drive that customer focus. And we thought we saw a lot of innovation, um, but many traditional industries sort of resisted that and, and kept doing and managing customer experience and poor operations very much in the traditional way because the tool sets were too difficult to use. Um, now, 20 years in, we're seeing customers out there expect a digital interface. They expect to be able to understand um, the way that they're interacting with uh, their different service providers. Uh, insurance is key to many people's financial well-being and uh, is rapidly continuing on this transformation. So I wanted to just talk to everyone a little bit about um, what's going on in insurance because it provides a lens that is applicable across any industry. So as you know, insurance has always been a financial transaction. Um, insurance carriers typically treat all of their backend operations as renewing a policy, processing a claim, et cetera. And they have a very uh, defined lens on that particular transaction. 
um, just about every insurance carrier out there is rapidly transforming, however. Um, they're starting to move to that customer journey view. What is the aggregate set of policies uh, that a customer has? What are the problems that they're facing um, uh, that they want coverage for? Uh, when it comes to a claim, how do they make it simple to submit that information through voice, through text, through any channel that they have? Uh, being able to collect all this data and use it appropriately is key for insurance carriers and, and just about any industry um, to use it to understand what that customer journey looks like. So when you see how insurance carriers are built today, um, many of them have legacy policy management platforms, right? The underwriting platform, um, they have a claims platform, a billing platform. Uh, just like the old mainframes, there's tons of complexity in traditional ETL. You need to extract data from those core policy management platforms and land it in policy data stores, then more ETL to move it into an enterprise data warehouse, even more logic to push it into reporting marts, and finally, business uh, logic up in those individual uh, Cognos reports, for example. Um, it can take a year to move data downstream and data is kind of locked into these patterns, into complex star schemas. It becomes a barrier to actually use all that important business data for uh, advanced analytics or even understanding what your customers are doing. So here at our AWS, we're helping insurance customers disrupt this. And what we're really trying to do is help insurance customers move towards driving a fifth platform within their organization. Of course, there are customer and agent facing platforms, customer websites, mobile applications, contact centers, the marketing campaigns that are used to interact with them, agent portals for agents to understand how they're interacting with customers. We're trying to use data to drive customized and relevant content to each one of these to provide the right insurance product, the right configuration, the right next best action to help a customer solve their problem. Similarly, data should be used to drive data-driven insights to the underwriting teams, uh, to recommend the right deductions, uh, limits, et cetera, in that policy configuration. And of course, data-driven insights to the claims team to assist with first notice of loss and that ability to ingest everything that happened for a particular claim without having to um, have claims adjusters double, triple entry data everywhere. And then lastly, very granular data down to the finance and risk management platforms. Um, so it eliminates those 10-day accounting, end of uh, quarter roll-ups, top side accounting adjustments, and really allows the finance and risk teams to mine the data um, to be very granular in their reserve setting, in their risk management, and in their financial transactions. So <clears throat> within AWS, it's this whole suite of services for analytics, data management, et cetera, that provide the capability for insurance carriers to transform the way that they do business. It's machine learning tools, natural language processing like Amazon Comprehend, to capture data from voice um, interactions, from emails, uh, from the documents that they're submitting themselves. It's Amazon recognition to capture images from accidents, from assets being documented. Um, it's the ability to capture that information and bring net new information into the insurance carrier that hasn't been captured before. Then on top of that, there's the analytics layer um, new non-SQL type databases to allow structured and unstructured information to be married together without all those SQL hops that I talked about earlier. Next are the fit for purpose databases. Uh, we're seeing insurance carriers move away from relational databases for everything, moving towards fit for purpose databases like document databases and graph databases to capture more data natively and enable <clears throat> all of that data to be easily used for downstream reporting um, at the point of capture rather than requiring ETL to move it uh, steadily along the process first. So when you get to what that next generation data environment looks like, um, it's not a data lake, it's not an enterprise data warehouse, it's a combination of tools and services 
that allow you to capture, store the right information within the right service, and then make it available uh, to each of the downstream consumers with that schema on read and fit for purpose queries. So if you look at the, this diagram, first you see that ability to capture the policy and claims data. No longer do you need the data to be pushed to an underlying ODS or a relational database and use complex SQL, um, complex uh, relational data models to describe each and every product. You can start to capture the entire policy, right? An insurance policy is a combination of uh, details about the insured, uh, the name, the address uh, of that particular person, the coverable, in the case of auto insurance, of course, the coverable is uh, the automobile, the make model of that car. Uh, the coverages are the terms, the limits, the deductibles, uh, the type of coverage um, and individual coverages on top of each uh, one of those, those vehicles, um, et cetera. You have different structures for each different policy type. A homeowner's policy has different data elements than a vehicle. Uh, umbrella policy has, has more attributes than uh, each one of those other policies. Being able to store and capture that as an entire record allows you to capture every quote, every submission, every version of that, every endorsement to that policy or change to terms, and you can store it as a record. Yes, there is data duplication, but the ability to capture that as a seamless record allows you to have an accurate view as was of that policy at each point in time. So it dramatically simplifies the ability to stream all that information downstream uh, to your business unit reporting, to your actuarial team, and even make it available to the regulatory uh, environment without needing complex SQL to recreate what that policy looked like at that particular time. Similarly, the semi-structured and unstructured data lake allows the submission forms, appraisals, claims documentation, voice transcriptions, email communications, sensor and IoT data to be captured and made available for advanced analytics. So in this way, without any ETL, we've captured all that core information about the policy, about the billing statements, about the claims, married it together with that external data um, and, and non-structured data, and then provide query tools like Amazon Redshift Spectrum, Amazon Glue, or Amazon Athena to finally apply one schema on read and make it available, whether it's SQL-based queries or non-SQL-based queries that should be uh, uh, disconnected from the way that the business users interact with that information. These query tools then allow you to have one single interface and make all that available. So it becomes very easy to add additional data elements upstream to your policy management platform and push them downstream to your business unit reporting uh, very quickly. So as you can see, in this way, insurance carriers are using the data that they have available to them today um, and using AWS services to make it much more quickly available to the downstream consumers. So Peter, I'll turn it back over to your team to kind of dive into our services and how you're helping uh, many industries uh, innovate in the same way. Thank you very much, Amy. That was, uh, that was very interesting. Thank you for that uh, peek through the window, as it were, onto the world of what uh, insurance companies, uh, technology teams, and what they're trying to accomplish with these new capabilities. So with that, I'll turn it over to Alexei and Oleg. We'll take you through uh, the types of architectures that our companies uh, that our customers are pursuing the reference modernization journey that we see emerge and uh, the kind of challenges uh, th that uh, uh, companies are faced with on each step of that uh, uh, journey and on each step of the way and then through uh, a number of particular and specific technologies with their pros and cons and how they're integrated together and what kind of business use cases they support alexei over to you yeah, uh, great. You hear me well, I assume. Um, okay, I'd like to kick things off today with just mentioning a few trends related to data happening in the business. So all you know, businesses recognize data now as a strategic asset and uh, of huge importance. But we see five specific key trends in data. First, data is growing exponentially 
you heard that it grows about 40% a year, it gets to zettabytes. But what's more important, we see more and more companies which store and analyze petabytes and exabytes of data. The second trend is the inflow of new data sources and, and companies are willing to make use of it for their business. This year is exceptional with pandemic situation and uh, I think it's obvious that for some companies ability to source and analyze this uh, data on virus and maybe its impact on supply chain on their business may be critical uh, of, you know, for, for their survival. Third trend is uh, the data diversity. Uh, companies use alternative data, graphs, clickstream data, documents, images, voice, and, and we see that unstructured data is growing faster than structured. And the fourth trend is the, the data is used or desired to be used by uh, many users in a business with different skills and different needs. We hear words like data literacy, data democratization, self-service analytics, all that. And the last term to mention is uh, there is no single use case for data. It may start with something, but then this use cases grow and grow and, and applications extend. Uh, machine learning, APIs, data-driven applications to mention a few. Now, some, some businesses are really using data analytics capabilities in an advanced way and they build competitive edge uh, using this. Such companies, the advanced ones, they grow eight, time, uh, eight to ten times faster than global economy. And here on the screen you see some categories of the use cases. Uh, such as immediate personalized uh, customer insights delivered in real time in the context of a customer. This experience is something what uh, clients uh, have in Uber and Airbnb, and these expectations of such experience translate from one industry to another. So basically such use cases, they built into this market success of the companies and allow them to adopt the changes in the business landscape. Now, how does the technology capabilities of these firms uh, differ? I think many of you seen this legacy data architecture. Uh, Jamie mentioned uh, bulk of it. You have your operational systems, data warehouse, a lot of ETL, uh, and that supports your reports and ABI workload. Now in this advanced terms, uh, they don't stop there. They have uh, elastic, uh, flexible uh, platforms of different data analytics technologies, which allow them to store and process any volume of data at any speed and support this advanced workload, such as uh, processing of unstructured data, ad hoc queries, uh, data science workloads, and so on. Now, um, but that's not that's not reality for every firm. Um, many companies are still stuck with H technology and for data capabilities. They may have siloed departmental data, dark data, which refers to a data which is used only for the prime purpose, but not for other use cases. From technology perspective, they may have uh, enterprise data warehouse with very long. Uh, implementation cycles for analytics. Uh, they're limited in scalability, they have high costs, and fundamentally they don't support this advanced functionality like uh, ad hoc queries, machine learning, data science, all these things which enable business uh, today to keep up with the speed of change. Now, what is the solution? And in our client situations, client conversations, we come to this conceptual view of modern data architecture and, and many of the solutions we build for our clients is a variation of what you will see on the slide. So here on the left, you see all your data sources, on-premise, cloud, alternative data, pretty much anything. And then it gets ingested um, to a data storage layer, which is a combination of data lake and data warehouse. Data lake takes any volume at any speed of raw data and then it can uh, be transformed to, to data in the in further in data lake or in data warehouse. And then the storage supports a variety of workloads from your uh, traditional standard BI reports and workloads to ad hoc queries, search, uh, data science notebooks, machine learning, predictive analytics, real time applications. But what's more important is in this modern data architecture, you have end to end platform services which cover 
things like data governance, data quality, security, data lineage, metadata management, all these things which were traditionally very, very difficult to put in place holistically and to end in any uh, legacy data architecture. And, and in this uh, conceptual model, they uh, go through everything, through ingestion, through storage, through workloads, from, through all the applications. Now, we talk to clients and they ask us, okay, you know, it's all good, this Nirvana state, but how do we actually get there? And there is no single answer to this question, but we have come to this reference journey of how clients uh, sometimes move to this advanced capabilities. So they may start with moving data and workloads to the cloud and breaking free from this legacy technologies, legacy limitations. They immediately start saving time and cost. They free up talent, which used to maintain and keep the lights on on their legacy systems. They, once in the cloud, they start uh, utilizing more managed and fully managed uh, data systems. And with that, they get to agility, they get to uh, scale, performance. They, with purpose-built databases, they support new, new use cases for particular types of data, particular types of analytics. They have things like uh, compliance, high availability, uh, just coming out of uh, fully managed services. And that gives them a foundation to then move to the third and fourth stage, which is building modern analytics and data-driven applications or modernization of the existing ones. So with that, they get to this new, faster insights to much broader access to data analytics across the business and, and external users. And they get to some advanced capabilities like machine learning. So that fundamentally drives the business outcomes. They get to better experiences, uh, deeper insights, more efficient processes, which then allows them to innovate and move further, build new products, new services, new capabilities, new operational models. And, and that leads to more customers, and then they take more data, and then the cycle kind of continues, and they put more data, more workloads to the cloud, and, and uh, extend their migration. Now, furthermore, in our conversations, clients uh, obviously ask, uh, you know, it's, it's a difficult exercise to, to follow this journey. And I won't be going through every single point on this slide, but there is a body of knowledge, accelerators, templates, tools, uh, best practices, which support uh, customers in this journey. And we're happy to talk further. Oleg will be mentioning quite a bit of that in his part, but we're happy to take it offline and, and see how we can help you on such a journey. Now, coming closer to the technology angle, I want to put it into a perspective of the, uh, some of the options for data architecture more, more common to see today. So the first one to mention is this on-premise vendor data warehouse or any other solution. It, you know, your traditional like Teradata, Vertica, or uh, Oracle solution. And, and the properties of that would be it's costly, you pay for licenses, infrastructure, you pay high price for people to look, look after this estate. Um, it doesn't really scale the uh, compute and storage are bound together. If you want to scale one, you have to scale both. Uh, it's pricey and, and ultimately it starts to lose in performance comparing to other options. So the second option is on-premise big data solutions. These are your Hadoop, Hive, Spark, Kafka, all this on-premise installation. And we love this technology. I mean, this technology is a part of pretty much all modern data and analytic solutions. And we see clients who were adopted it five, ten years ago. But uh, back then, it was the only option to run it on-premise. Today, they realize it's a lot of headache, it's a lot of maintenance costs. It's on premise, again, you don't get elasticity of a cloud, so it's hard to scale, you have to scale hardware. So these are the downsides. The third option is a cloud vendor stack. Uh, for example, if you take data warehousing, Snowflake is one of the very popular names in this space. And, and we have many clients who come to us and they, they think, okay, all we need is data warehouse, it will cover all our needs. In some cases, that's indeed the case, but uh, you need to keep in mind that each of these solutions built for particular purpose, for particular workloads, and uh, data warehousing, you know, works great on structured data, BI reports and workloads, but uh, 
if you push time series data or graph data or streaming data to it, it will struggle, there will be a gap. So with that, I come to the fourth option, which is the cloud native data platform, such as AWS platform we'll be talking about today. So it's integrated, flexible data solution. It basically, you pick a right tool for the job, you uh, pick the building blocks of different purpose-built databases and, and analytical engines to support your use cases, your workloads, exactly the way Jamie was describing it. You have end-to-end -end, uh, security and compliance and uh, high availability properties which come out of, of the platform. It's future-proof because the technologies are added to such a cloud-native data platform maybe faster than you can implement your use cases. It basically supports your modern capability all the way. Here's a high-level view of what AWS provides uh, in all these categories. You have your very housing, lakes, real-time uh, analytics, uh, search, BI, machine learning use cases. And, and here, more specifically, uh, you've seen this part on uh, Jamie's site as well. These are specific AWS services. And here I want to relate back to the conceptual modern data architecture. Below you see data movement, ingestion layer, data lake, uh, chip storage of uh, data in any format, lake formation to automate and secure. We'll be covering it today uh, for, for a data lake. Glue to move data around. And then you have, in the middle part, you have the whole layer of purpose-built databases and analytical engines which shine on specific use cases and workloads. And then on the very top, you have the API and machine learning uh, components which allow you to you know, ultimately build these business applications and, and support your business with data. Now, you know, I mentioned this AWS data platform, but I want to uh, say a couple of words of why we think it's different uh, comparing to other options on the market today. And there are two things to mention. So first is this concept of fit for purpose databases, and we really do think it's, it's very powerful. Um, so why, why does it matter? Think how software was built 10 years ago. You know, developers were bound to use this relational database. That was the only option uh, available to them. Today, it's different. You may have three, four different data engines in one particular system. You may use document for JSON files, uh, graph database, time series, key value for high load uh, workloads. And all this data need to be not ETL'd to the analytical system, but it needs to be connected and made really available. You don't want to stop your application to, you know, back up and push this data. All these aspects really do dictate how the modern architecture is laid out. And the second point is with uh, cloud uh, adoption, some of the data technologies like relational databases were fully re-engineered. Uh, compute was separated from storage, and that gives you further benefits. This is uh, the a view of today's picture of what AWS provides, and we'll be speaking more about it today, all the different key value, document, graph, time series, uh, ledger for immutable storage. And uh, on the bottom of the slide, you see uh, use cases where this um, purpose-built technology shine in different industries. Um, and the second point, the second differentiating point I want to cover is this uh, fully, ser uh, fully serviced, fully managed uh, uh, offering or serverless offering. So why should you care? First of all, it gives you this uh, elastic uh, scalability. It supports your needs in terms of data, like today and tomorrow, and, and processing needs. It allows you to uh, use the data from operational systems in uh, analytical systems easily. Uh, there are tools to migrate your systems to the fully managed uh, offering. So it supports you on this journey. And, and this further slide, this further slide, demonstrates it's more. So on the left side here, you see all the things you need to do if you self-manage your data architecture. This is what's called undifferentiated heavy lifting. It's all you have to do just to keep the lights on and it consumes your best talent, time it doesn't allow you to move. And on the right side, you see this fully managed uh, offering and uh, how little you actually need to focus on yourself. You're basically doing innovation and the rest uh, comes uh, from, from the platform. In today's world, it's uh, 
not the big fish, it's the small fish, it's the fast fish, which eats the uh, slow fish, and this is actually enables you to be the fast fish. And now concluding slide with my part is, uh, this is the picture of today's fully managed uh, service offerings from AWS. And, uh, on the bottom of the slide, you see all this vendor and open source technologies which you may be using today. And you see the equivalent in AWS and uh, the technologies uh, mature uh, in, in the cloud platform. Basically, AWS keeps it open in terms of open data formats, open APIs, the, uh, the same APIs as the open source. And furthermore, in many of these technologies, AWS became a, a leading contributor to the open source versions of that. Now, maybe these fully managed uh, uh, service offerings don't cover every single workload as of now, but we do help our clients to come to optimal architecture to support their workloads and see where it can fit best to get all these benefits I've been mentioning. And with that, I'd like to uh, give the microphone to my colleague Oleg, who will be doing a deeper dive into the AWS data technologies and uh, um, and and uh, some of the migration uh, steps and the innovations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alexei. Thank you, Jamie. Yeah, let's dive deeper into all these uh, technologies. So let's start with uh, AWS uh, Data Warehouse, uh, Redshift. Redshift is a fully managed, secure, horizontally and vertically scalable integrated uh, data warehouse that is committed to open format uh, standards. Uh, at this slide, uh, you see that uh, Redshift uh, keeps innovating at incredible uh, phase. Innovations are focused on reducing cost of integration, ease of migration and development, and making performance and scalability the best among uh, cloud uh, data warehouses. Here you see recent innovations that were done in um, 2020 and late 19. Uh, let's review key innovations um, today. Um, recent innovation, Amazon introduced new Redshift instances called RA3. Uh, these are instances with managed storage and independent compute nodes. Uh, this innovation helps to support cost-efficient analysis of data because you can choose the necessary number of compute nodes based on your performance requirements and pay for scale, pay for and scale for compute and storage independently. Elastic resizing is another feature uh, that allows to change number or type of compute nodes during the resizing of your warehouse all connected clients will stay connected uh, queries will be paused and uh, warehouse will be in operational mode uh, and before elastic resize was introduced aws elastic resize typically was done between two hours and two days now it takes around 10 to 15 minutes. And you can schedule elastic resizes based on your business needs. In data warehouse environments, uh, applications often need to perform complex queries on large tables, uh, perform multi-table joins and aggregations that potentially contain millions or sometimes billions of rows. Uh, processing of these queries can be expensive in terms of system resources and the time it takes to compute the results. Materialized views contain a pre-compiled set based on uh, result based on a um, SQL query that was executed over one or more tables and it allows to use less resources and return uh, results back to BI or users much faster. Uh, these views are especially useful for speeding up queries that have predictable and repeated um, patterns. You can schedule updates for materialized views and uh, control when they are recomputed. Uh, materialized views could be a very good replacement or alternative for complex BI models and uh, brings you closer to 
BI platform independence. Uh, AWS created uh, recently analytics uh, hardware processors that makes operations like compression, encryption, filtering, aggregations 10 times faster. Uh, hardware accelerators uh, are used by AWS not only for Redshift, they are applying hardware acceleration to other solutions as well. Uh, this is a big advantage of, of these solutions and innovation and, and, and cloud native technology. Aqua Accelerator will make Redshift 10 times faster than any other data cloud data warehouse without increasing cost for AWS customers. And integration, uh, innovations in integration area and investment of AWS in integration is very beneficial for uh, customers. So answering a little bit on um, Eva's question that she asked in, in the chat, uh, today you can query data across operational databases, RDS, Aurora, uh, directly from S3, uh, from other uh, Redshift databases from AWS formation in Redshift that, al that allows you to minimize unnecessary ETL implementations and incorporate live uh, data and BI in, in BI and reporting applications directly uh, without delays caused by ETL pipelines. Uh, you also have an option to integrate Redshift with other uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning services. Um, so this is another nice feature. Uh, Redshift supports export and uh, unload data uh, in parquet format uh, to Amazon S3 data lakes for faster sharing and analytics. This makes sharing data across um, data lake easier and faster and again, without uh, specific ETL um, data conversions. And this feature plays well with um, newly added ability by AWS Lake Formation to share data across uh, accounts, internal and external. And more, uh, geometry now is a native type in uh, Redshift and you combine geospatial data with um, business data, uh, with cluster, uh, warehouse cluster pause, you can pause the development of QI, QA cluster during non-business operation hours. You can run ETL cluster only during load and unload. Um, with ML powered uh, Redshift advisor, you can continuously monitor millions of data points to detect, analyze, and surface issues before they impact your users and also get actionable recommendations to optimize cost and performance. Stored procedures on Redshift is fully driven, um, feature is fully driven by customers review uh, requests. Uh, they, customers wanted uh, uh, stored procedure support for easier migration of existing workloads from legacy on-prem databases. And um, they support PL SQL, PG SQL uh, query language. And um, you, so with that, we conclude in uh, a Redshift, a kind of recent innovations overview, but I think they are very important because uh, all of these innovations, as I mentioned, were done in basically last several months. Uh, you do not need a relation or the, the column data store or warehouse for all cases. Uh, your, for all of your business cases. Uh, very often you still need relational databases with transactional data that is highly structured and data records created, updated and deleted on, on a row basis and have strict relations between them. So AWS provides RDS, stands for, st uh, stands for relational data service and Amazon Aurora as a relational data store. RDS supports Oracle, MS SQL, and other popular commercial and open source uh, databases. So Athe Aurora um, uh, requires special attentions because, attention because recently AWS introduced 
a huge number of enhancements uh, to Aurora. Basically, it was fully rewritten and um, relational database uh, on Aurora now supports separate compute and storage um, uh, layers, so, same as um, Redshift or uh, Snowflake. So basically it supports multi-tenancy. Um, it allows you to make six copies of data distributed across different data centers and still be 35 uh, times faster than traditional MySQL database. This perhaps makes uh, Aurora uh, best in a class relational uh, cloud database that we have um, today. Um, and again, it's fully managed. Um, uh, so you do not take care of updates. Uh, and due to that, uh, according to AWS, you have 39% lower uh, three-year cost of database operations, three-year ROI, and five-month uh, payback period. Again, uh, in many cases, you may need not relational, not warehouse database, but uh, key value uh, data storage. Um, and um, usually applications query uh, such data by keys. So DynamoDB is a database that fit for that purpose. In fact, very, it is a fully serverless uh, for you. So you do not have to manage database nodes, backups, or anything else. So it's next level from uh, fully managed. Um, it, it provides you with single digit millisecond performance and can handle more than trillion requests per day and supports um, uh, up to 20 million requests per second. Um, this type of database is uh, ideal for um, uh, mobile, web, gaming, uh, IoT applications that require low latency access at any scale. Uh, there is a big, um, uh, big share of document, Mon MongoDB-based databases that uh, requires um, uh, running at scale and uh, AWS enables mission-critical Mong MongoDB workloads uh, storage and compute of uh, document DB is also fully decoupled and allows you to scale them independently. This database is ideal for shopping sites, for online publications, and um, yeah, Amazon, for example, supports migration of MongoDB to document DB and provide you with a free uh, six month period for data migration services. Um, Cassandra is another column uh, database uh, and manage Cassandra servers, server services fully serverless. Again, it's next level from managed databases. So you will be paying for only uh, resources you are using. And uh, also Elastic Cache supported. Uh, this is um, uh, in-memory databases that uh, require uh, real-time uh, use cases such as caching, session stores, gaming, and real-time analytics. And other, so uh, graph databases, um, Neptune, you can build now knowledge graphs. This functionality that is very challenging to implement with traditional uh, or databases or warehouses. Amazon Time Stream is specialized uh, serverless uh, database that efficiently supports uh, time series and QLDB quantum ledger database is a fully managed database that provides a transparent immutable and cryptographically uh, verifiable transaction log owned by central central trusted authority. Typically it is used to record the history of economic and uh, financial activity. Uh, these are databases, uh, but in, in, in every case, uh, whatever technology you use, when you're using, uh, moving to the cloud, you need a foundation for innovations and analytics. So I would say that Lake Formation Service is, is providing you with uh, this foundation. It helps you to achieve three primary goals. Uh, SQL, uh, single security and governance layer, 
uh, manage um, S3 analytics permissions in one place and uh, easily build integrated uh, pipelines. So with all this variety of data, and thank you, Cliff, for asking this question uh, in, in, in the uh, webinar chat, you need a comprehensive um, solution for data cataloging, governance, uh, discovery, standardization in one place. So uh, Lake Formation is providing that based on um, AWS, um, uh, a, a, uh, based on uh, AWS uh, Glue catalog. So it sits between all your data sources and, and consumers and uh, uh, basically allows you to streamline your uh, data governance and administration um, uh, activities. Uh, also, Lake Formation helps you to implement easy data ingestion. Um, uh, for that, Lake Formation provides blueprints that allow you to ingest, ingest data from databases and other sources to S3. Uh, these blueprints are uh, very suitable for simple data movement and jobs. And another big advantage is that there is a, a market of technical partners, technology partners, that can help you with implementation of more complex um, transformations if, let's say, you do not want to write code. Uh, partners such as Matillion and others help you to, to solve that uh, um, task and also integrated uh, goal and also well integrated with AWS. AWS. Uh, recent innovation in Glue, uh, Glue is a native ETL uh, tool, uh, is that uh, there is Glue 2.0 available uh, with significant improvement of uh, performance of um, ETL jobs uh, start time. And uh, another innovation, uh, which is actually big, now you can, using Lake Formation, you can share data across uh, organizational accounts and uh, even with, the, with external accounts. So you pay only for basically your storage and you do not pay for any compute associated with data sharing for anything else. You're using Data Lake for free and paying only for uh, underlying data and compute services. So um, this feature is, is excellent. It, it, it helps to address a lot of uh, business issues very efficiently. Um, and with Lake Formation, it has now integration with Amazon Neptune. You can start building your knowledge graphs, which is again, uh, foundation for data lineage and data standardization, data governance. So it's definitely, you know, good future, good good features, but uh, you need to jump to this future re relatively easy. And other than accelerators, AWS in collaboration with Data Art and other migration partners provide also methodologies. So. Uh, basically, you have three options to move to the cloud, uh, re-host, re-platform, and re-factor. Re-host, you move into just another instance uh, and uh, you keep managing this instance. With uh, re-platform, uh, you get in managed uh, service, so you get in rid of uh, many operational tasks that you ha have to perform. And then in order to truly uh, uh, innovate, you probably will need to refactor your existing uh, systems and uh, util start utilizing uh, build for purpose uh, databases. And all that could be done in, 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 in parallel or um, as a hybrid approach. So um, these are three options. Then uh, we support um, a kind of standardized approach to your modernization uh, journey, uh, starting with assessment of migration uh, readiness of, you know, creating business case with um, use of assessment accelerators such as immersion days, workshops, um, and, and others. And then uh, on the second stage, uh, mobilization, this is where you're preparing uh, your cloud infrastructure and maybe conducting some 
POCs to, um, uh, to get proof of concept of, of, of migration and some confidence that certain business cases could be implemented. And then migration phase. Uh, during the pilot migration selection, there is um, uh, also a framework how to select a good candidates. So AWS and migration partners can help you with that. And uh, we also um, uh, provide uh, visibility around key steps uh, in data migration, such as schema conversion and um, database migration, and uh, making sure that post-pilot legacy power of um, um, uh, the database process is performed um, uh, gradually, gracefully, and uh, with minimizing uh, risk. So all these methodologies ac as accelerators e exist uh, that help to simplify um, your, your cloud, uh, streamline your cloud journey. And um, in order to uh, basically uh, utilize tools, uh, th there are two major migration accelerators exist. One is AWS schema conversion tool uh, uh, that um, allows you to automate migration on all stages um, of your journey. So it allows to uh, automatically read structure and metadata in source database, generates target database schema, even if you migrate into different technology, let's say from Oracle to Athena or from SQL to Athena, and it provides you reports with recommendations and suggestions what needs to be resolved manually if tool cannot uh, address certain issue. Schema conversion tool also helps to automate different schema conversions like changes in syntaxes and, and other routine tasks. And uh, AWS Data Migration Service, DMS, is a primary service that helps you to streamline the migration itself. You can do a lot with it, such as rollbacks, DR, automating mapping, automated mapping creation. Uh, you can generate and um, streamline creation of cloud formation scripts, which is um, infrastructure as code for, for your data warehouse and more. I highly recommend to, to check this uh, AWS DMS blog to, to see the, the art of possible and uh, to uh, basically look up your business cases and see how they could be addressed. Yes, with that, with that we're concluding uh, the overview and um, over to Peter. I hope we will have time to answer to, to your questions. Wow, Th thank you, Oleg. I got a little bit dizzy from the slides you know, blazing past me. Um, and apologies to the audience, as you can see, like we said, there's so much ground to cover and only 60 minutes even less to cover it. So uh, no worries though, you will have the ability to review this information at your own speed. There's gonna be a recording. Um, uh, it's gonna be going up in a couple of days. So uh, uh, have no fear there if you weren't able to fully uh, absorb the content of uh, several slides. I know I wasn't able to, for sure. Um, we do have at least one unanswered question. Oleg, would you like to take a stab at uh, the question from Thomas? Uh, yeah, yes, absolutely. So uh, Athena is a good uh, tool that allows to query raw data or column data. So uh, basically it queries um, data from uh, JSON or CSV files, and this is a data lake tool. It it scales very well. You can query data from Athena or, you know, hundreds uh, megabytes and, and ter is good. Uh, if you need uh, uh, high performance and uh, your queries needs to be exposed to uh, business users, uh, you probably will be looking to provide them with alternative tools, uh, more uh, more costly compute will be associated with that. But for data science purposes, for uh, quick explorations, for quick queries uh, in, in your data lake without doing any transformations, you can use um, uh, 
AWS Athena. And uh, Athena also, again, if performance uh, is, um, is satisfactory for you, uh, Athena is serverless, right? Uh, you can also expose um, uh, data from Athena to uh, BI tools such as uh, QuickSight. So I, I would say it's fully def defined by your uh, business cases, but in many cases, yes, you do not need uh, special uh, relational even databases. If you already have data in, in, in your data lake ingested in S3, you can start using it right away for data science and just for simple queries. Thank you. Um, I do want to make one quick remark before we run out of time. Um, so Oleg mentioned uh, and spend some time on the on uh, AWS Lake Formation and the, on the data lake as such uh, being the foundational piece for your future data infrastructure and analytics capabilities. Data Art, in collaboration with the AWS team, has built uh, what we would refer to as a blueprint blueprint implementation of a data lake that's uh, in accordance with very stringent security and uh, data protection requirements. Uh, for example, uh, that insurance customers are faced with. So we have that solution available. What we'll be doing in next session, there's gonna be a webinar in the month of November that uh, you're all invited to. And please, as they say, watch this space and reach out to us if you would like to make sure we, we, we send you an invitation where we will take you through the design and the architecture for that solution and review the capabilities that it provides. In a nutshell, um, we, we're trying to show how easy it is leveraging the cloud native services from AWS, how easy it is to stand up some very serious capability in a matter of literally minutes. In under half an hour, you can create um, a, a, a data lake that's capable of some uh, really interesting things in support of uh, important uh, use cases for your business. Um, we have less than one minute uh, left. I wanna thank our speakers. Thank you guys so much for joining us today and sharing uh, this content and insight. This is AWS content refracted through the prism of, of data arts experience and what we're working on with our customers. We're looking forward to continuing these conversations with you guys. Um, be on the lookout for the email with the link to the recording. And thanks again, and uh, we hope you have a great day.